East Anglia appears to be the home of the lawnmower. There was no doubt about it, Suffolk Punch was out there at the front. Whatever the future holds for this most British of inventions, there's some traditions that always stay. In the 16th century, bowling became so popular that Henry VIII imposed a fine, a financial penalty, on anybody that had a bowling green in their own grounds. Oh, not bad. Despite this, people still continued to play games. People used to gamble on the results of the game. They were very important. And because of this, it became even more important to have a perfect surface on your bowling green. You can imagine you've just... You've just bet £10, maybe, on the results of the match, and there's this little undulation. So we started to take a great deal of care of our lawns. Now, that was fine when they were small. You, know, you could lavish care on this manicured plot. But once we started to let the lawn loose beyond the bowling green, once it started to expand out into the garden, you couldn't any longer go round with the equivalent of the nail clippers. You had to start siding it. You had to have gangs of men siding up and down your lawn. Endless labour, endless wages. What are we going to do about it? In 1830, along comes a man from Gloucestershire who was to change the face of our landscape. The budding lawnmower was introduced in 1832 and uh, Ransoms of the company bought the patent from Edwin Budding to manufacture what we now know as the cylinder mower. Budding was working in a, a Gloucestershire cotton factory, or cloth factory perhaps rather than cotton factory, and he observed the way the nap was cut off the cloth. And that essentially was um, knives that were rotating on, on, on a cylinder and they actually cut the nap off the cloth and he thought, hang on, this could be a lawnmower. Edwin Budding took that principle and put it into a frame and the roller that contacts the ground drove the gears and they turned the cutting cylinder. The cylinder passes across a blade at the bottom and scythes or slices the grass off and uh, the inertia of the cylinder turning would then transfer it into the grass box that may or may not have been mounted in the front of the machine. During the early years, not long after the invention of the first lawnmowers, Ransoms picked up the idea quite early on and in their first 15 or 20 years, in fact, I think between 1832 and 1859, they actually produced about 1,500 lawnmowers. Well, that's not many more than one a week. And you can see that the early days of the invention, it was sort of a difficult thing to break into. The interest uh, grew and grew, and more manufacturers came on board. Uh, Alexander Shanks, to name but one. And on board, he came with the horse-drawn lawnmower and from 1845 through to about 1860 various mods were made and they came out with smaller versions eventually being towed or, or, or walked behind a pony hence Shanks's pony. This incident connected with lawnmowers happened in the late 1920s when uh, there were very few motorised lawnmowers and most of the big estates who had large areas of grass had to invest in horse-drawn lawnmowers. And my father, who was a head gardener at the time, had one such machine. And this was a fairly hefty contraption with a five-foot cylinder cut with just one control, engage and disengage. And then comes the ritual of getting ready for operations 
where the horse had to be harnessed to this thing, it also had to have four leather shoes put on, of which it wasn't always amenable, according to Father. One, one. But once in operation, they had been up and down this large area of grass four or five times, and they reached the boundary of the grass, which bordered on the only road that led from Norwich to London then. And as they turned, a heavy vehicle came up, which was a food and steam wagon, which May Gurney's used to use in those days, a heavy ballast, let off a piercing blast with its whistle, and also a hell of a jet of steam. <laughs> well, poor old horse stood on his hind legs, took off. Father held on for the first 80 yards. Horse carried on, through another hawthorn fence, through two more fields, and finished up somewhere the other side of the other side. <laughs> This is a Ransom Simpson Head automaton built in the 1870s. Um, a very expensive mower in its time. Only the very rich and the aristocracy would be able to afford them. Women are closely associated with lawn mowers from, well, for the last hundred years. From the end of the 19th century, women are used a lot in lawnmower advertisements, and they're actually shown not just admiring the lawnmower as someone else uses it, but using the lawnmower themselves. The lawnmower manufacturers are trying to appeal directly to the woman to say, you could use this mower. It's very easy to use, it doesn't involve a lot of effort. You yourself could use it to keep your own lawn, your own front garden tidy. And making the whole job look extremely easy. Not at all my experience of pushing one of those old lawn mowers at all. In 1869, Fullers and Bate actually invented something completely different to that which had gone before. It was the side wheel lawn mower. And would you believe we still make it today? It's called the Full Bait, made by Qualcast here at Stowe Market in Suffolk. In fact, that particular type of lawn mower still sells around 50,000 units every year in the UK and probably five times that many in continental Europe. This is a Ransom's Ace. It's a, it's a side wheel mower made in the late 1930s specifically for working on mounds and banks. It's got a long 72 inch handle that was specifically designed to mount on studs at the rear of the machine and you swung the machine up and down the bank. Wimbledon is the mecca of the world's tennis stars where only superlative turf is acceptable. For generations head groundsmen have used Ransom's hand mowers exclusively. Lawn tennis really took off in about the 1880s and by the 1900s, turn of the century, there wasn't a single country house of any pretension or any size that didn't have at least one tennis court. So to keep all of that in order, you turn to the mechanical mower. At the turn of the century, the search was still on for the perfect motive power behind the mower. We tried boys, tried men, women, ponies, they even tried steam. And then Ransoms invented the petrol-driven motor mower. In 1902, Ransoms were the first mower manufacturer in the world to fit the internal combustion engine onto a mowing machine. And that was supplied to Cadbury's, um, and that machine is still uh, around today. This is an example, a very early example of one of those, approximately a 1908. The Ransoms were the forerunners, really, of self-propelled mowers, and probably still are. They had their patent uh, box em emptying mechanism, which was a wonderful idea, where a sweep board pushes the grass out of one side of the grass box. The carburetor is called an updraft carburetor. It's a foot below the sparking plug. I'm just priming the fuel system as it's... So if it fires on the fuel that's just primed into the cylinder head, and once the engine's fired, it automatically draws its fuel up from the carburetor then. It's just to assist the starting.
drill used one to cut the lawn and it makes his job just as good as the modern day mower. Right up to the First World War, nearly all the lawnmowers were heavy affairs, either steam driven, horse drawn, or with great petrol engines and really far too heavy for most lawns. But in 1921, and importantly for us, Charles H. Pugh developed what was to be for us the first lightweight petrol powered cylinder lawnmower. It was a chain driven affair and one of the companies in the Charles Pew group was Atlas Chain Company. And lo and behold, the Atco is what it was called. That's how the name evolved. And during 1921, the first year, we actually built 700. We tried to sell these through what were essentially outlets that were interested in selling lawnmowers, but this one they said, no, it's a toy, it's a gimmick, it's too light, it'll never catch on. So Charles H. Pugh actually bought some Rudge motorcycles, converted them with a flatbed sidecar, and actually went round the country themselves, selling these lawnmowers from stately home to stately home. And lo and behold, during that first 12 months, they sold the lot. It was then that dealerships came on board, and essentially the um, lawnmower industry in the UK has grown ever since. I arrived here, and Mrs. Bott made me a nice cup of coffee, and we had a chat, and she said, would you like to come and see the old lawnmowers in the shed? And I said yes. I couldn't even see the shed at first. Complete darkness inside. Dragged it out. Absolutely huge lawnmower. And it was a Dennis. Dennis is a Derby-based uh, company. We're privately owned. The family uh, shareholders, there's four of us all together. And we employ 22 people up at the Derby Works, manufacturing and assembling the range of lawnmowers we produce. Many of the original uh, drawings are still in use today that were on the 1922 mowers, believe it or not. Uh, so, yeah, I would say that they're very much built to the same standards, although we've innovated the designs to suit today's marketplace. Large houses are still uh, good customers of Dennis, but we sell a lot of product into sports grounds, cricket, tennis, bowls uh, and golf, as well as, as I say, the, the person who's looking for a good quality ornamental lawn. They're a very reliable product, um, you know, a lot of the machines have been going now for 40, 50, 60 years and we do still supply spare parts for them. This mower I'm rather proud of because I, I brought this in almost a scrap condition, I've completely restored it, it's a Ransom's 1935 14 inch midget mower with a one horse engine in it and there was only 1,059 of these mowers made. The growth of the suburbs, and with it the suburban lawn, led to a demand for a cheaper mass-produced machine. Companies such as Qualcast, Suffolk Iron Foundry, who were producing machines such as the Suffolk Punch, ideal for everybody's lawn. 